Our next speaker is currently has position in the University um, of California, Irvin. He's a uh, uh, another PhD student of the Climatic Research Unit, Ben Santa. After his PhD, he moved to the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology in 1987 to work on the detection and attribution of climate change, and then expanded this work after his move to the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California in the early 1990s. Uh, his work was supported the first definitive finding that humans had discernible impacts on global climate. And he has made many major contributions to IPCC assessment reports. Ben will speak on fingerprinting the climate system. Please, Ben. Thank you very much, Trevor, and happy 50th birthday to crew. <clears throat> This picture here follows nicely from Kate's presentation. It's the total amount of water vapor in Earth's atmosphere on a certain day. And column integrated water vapor is one of the variables that we've looked at in trying to understand fingerprints of human influence in the climate system. I'll get back to water vapor a little bit later. So just briefly about myself, uh, I'm a climate scientist my undergraduate education was at UEA in ENV. I did my PhD in CREW uh, and a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute in Hamburg. My research is in fingerprinting the climate system and my hobby is rock climbing. One of the joys of my life is that my son Nick persuaded me to unretire from rock climbing a couple of years ago uh, this is us a couple of months ago climbing a Joshua Tree National Monument in the United States. <clears throat> Trevor mentioned the IPCC discernible human influence finding. So the IPCC has issued six scientific assessments since 1990. The 1990 assessment essentially concluded that the jury was out in terms of whether humans were affecting global climate. Uh, Tom Wigley and Tim Barnett were the convening lead authors of the critical detection and attribution chapter of that first IPCC report. The second report that Trevor mentioned five years later in 1995 came to a very different conclusion. And uh, that conclusion was encapsulated in these infamous 12 words the balance of evidence suggests a discernible human influence on global climate. <clears throat> I was the convening lead author of that chapter. Tom was one of the lead authors of that chapter, Tom Wigley. And it's fair to say, I think, that uh, that finding uh, produced some fairly healthy ripples politically, scientifically, and also uh, in the media and public. It was an extraordinary claim. Back then, it was the claim of detection of a human-caused global warming signal by a major international scientific assessment. And subsequent IPCC reports strengthened and affirmed that cautious balance of evidence finding. So in 2001 uh, and 2007, the IPCC tried to uh, introduce this calibrated likelihood language eventually in 2013, concluding that it was extremely likely that human activity had been the dominant cause of warming since um, <clears throat> the mid 20th century. And in the most recent sixth assessment report, which came out in 2021 that Kate mentioned, uh, we had this <clears throat> use of the word unequivocal. It is now unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean and land. So this has been the arc of history and it's bent towards increased understanding of the reality of human effects on global climate. One of the things I'm gonna try and address is how, um, what was the science that underpinned this increase in scientific understand, understanding? <clears throat> so let's look at that. Um, I think that one, influential development was 
uh, just the improvements of climate models in the late 80s and at the time of the first IPCC report, we had uh, models with relatively primitive representation of the uppermost ocean, um, <clears throat> only about a half dozen uh, global climate models of the atmosphere and ocean. In today's world, we have over 100 different climate models. These are true models of the Earth system. Uh, that look not only at the atmosphere and ocean and sea ice, but also at the carbon cycle, ocean biogeochemistry, atmospheric chemistry, uh, interactions, say, between sea level rise and three-dimensional ice sheets. These are fundamentally different beasts than we had in the late 80s. <clears throat> we have a better understanding of the factors that affect climate, of natural internal climate variability and of so-called external forcings, uh, think changes in the sun's energy output, volcanic eruptions, human-caused changes in greenhouse gases, particulate pollution, uh, et cetera. And I would say that crew has played a key role in this better understanding of factors that influence climate. This is a picture of Phil and Tom at uh, an early meeting in Villach in the mid 1980s. They had a seminal paper in Nature in 1991, in which they really recognized um, <clears throat> very, very early on in the game of trying to identify human effects on global climate, that natural climate variability was a big deal. And that in order to determine at which seasons and which geographical locations, we might stand the best chance of identifying human effects on climate, we had to understand the seasonal and uh, geographical structure of natural climate variability. This is a key sentence from their 1981 Nature paper. Although it is widely believed that increasing atmospheric CO2 levels will cause noticeable global warming, the effects are not yet detectable, possibly because of the noise of natural climatic variability. <clears throat> That was prescient and they were right. It was indeed natural variability that was um, <clears throat> hampering the early detection of human effects on climate. Subsequently, in a very famous paper in Nature in 1990, Tom and Sarah Raper expanded on the investigation of natural climate variability using a variety of different models. Uh, <clears throat> indeed, a model that they had developed at CRU and their bottom line finding uh, also holds up well over time. Natural trends of up to 0.3 degrees Celsius may occur over intervals of up to 100 years. Although the magnitude of such trends is unexpectedly large, it is insufficient to explain the observed global warming during the 20th century. <clears throat> and I think another real seminal development in terms of this better understanding of factors influencing climate. I talked in the previous two slides about uh, <clears throat> Crew's efforts to uh, improve our understanding of natural internal climate variability. Tom's work in the late 1980s in particular looked at the impact of human-caused sulfate aerosol pollution. He was one of the first to do that and in a paper in Nature in 1989, uh, he concluded that the effects of SO2 may have significantly offset the temperature changes that have resulted from the greenhouse effect. Another scientific finding that has um, <clears throat> stood up well over time. And indeed, it was that early work in the mid eighties that jump-started efforts of modeling centers to better understand the combined effects of greenhouse induced warming and sulfate aerosol induced regional cooling. <clears throat> Another um, <clears throat> facilitator of uh, this scientific progress over this sequence of six IPCC reports was better observations. And uh, <clears throat> Phil, I think, uh, and others at CREW played a key role um, <clears throat> Phil showed you and spoke about the development of surface temperature data at the Climatic Research Unit. This was from a seminal paper um, by Phil, Tom, and Peter Wright in 1986. 
And it started with the um, understated statement, recent homogenized near surface temperature data over the land and oceans of both hemispheres are combined to produce the first comprehensive estimates of global mean temperature. For folks like me, beginning to look at patterns of climate change in the late 1980s and early 1990s to try and determine the causes of changes in patterns of climate change at Earth's surface, the availability of these long-term records uh, from CRU and from other institutes was critical. We couldn't have done this work without these uh, data sets. And more recently, without satellite estimates of atmospheric temperature change, which we now have for the last 43 years. <clears throat> Another reason for progress was um, <clears throat> the community-wide analysis of climate model results. So essentially the crowdsourcing of analysis of um, <clears throat> model simulation output, that was something that really took off in the late 1980s and early 1990s with the rise of model intercomparison projects like AMIP or CMIP, which uh, Kate has already mentioned. And it was the availability of these benchmark simulations and the making available of the simulation output to the entire world diagnostic community that eventually led to better diagnosis of models, um, identification of systematic errors, in many cases, recognition of the causes of those errors um, <clears throat> that ultimately led to better climate models. The community has also benefited from infrastructure, things like the Earth System Grid Federation for moving around petabytes of simulation output, um, satellite data, visualization software, we've gotten better at sharing. <clears throat> Finally, I would argue that progress uh, in, in confirming human effects on global climate has also been uh, strongly enabled by climate fingerprinting. So what is fingerprinting? The basic premise is that different influences on climate, natural and human, have different characteristic signatures. And those signatures are easier to discern if you look uh, at complex geographical patterns of climate change or at altitudinal patterns, slices through the atmosphere or slices through the ocean. Just like in forensics, um, <clears throat> fingerprints are divided into different characteristic groups in order to discriminate between uh, different individuals. The premise is that in fingerprinting the climate system, we can do the same thing. We can come up with characteristic patterns, say in this case, for the sun's fingerprint on climate. What you see here is a model calculation. This is from an older climate model, the so-called parallel climate model developed uh, jointly at the National Center for Atmospheric Research and Los Alamos National Lab. And in this parallel climate model, you can do the thought experiment that we can't do in the real world. You can change just the sun's energy output according to our best understanding of how the sun may actually have changed over the 20th century. When you run the model with changes in the sun's energy output, which we think were relatively small over the 20th century, you get heating throughout the full vertical extent of the atmosphere with the exception of some um, small cooling uh, at the poles. And that's in part because this is a very noisy signal. Uh, <clears throat> at the poles, we have uh, large natural variability and uh, the change in the sun's energy output over the 20th century is thought to be relatively small. In this model and in many other models, this would be the fingerprint of uh, a slightly increased sun over the 20th century. And you can use the same model to do other thought experiments where you change only one thing at a time, uh, where you change, for example, only volcanic activity, according to our best understanding of 20th century changes in volcanoes, where you 
include human caused increases in CO2, methane, chlorofluorocarbons, and other greenhouse gases, where you drive uh, the model just with changes in sulfate pollution, um, the kind of SO2 pollution that Tom studied in, uh, <clears throat> or was one of the first to study in the late 1980s. And you can look at changes in tropospheric and stratospheric ozone. Now, each one of these plots, again, is a slice through the atmosphere from the North Pole to the South Pole, uh, from the surface right up to 30 kilometers. And without getting into the details of these things, I just want you to note that they're different. And the premise in fingerprinting is that we can exploit these pattern differences to disentangle the influences of different human and natural factors on the climate system. So who was um, influential in kickstarting this field of pattern-based fingerprinting? Uh, I would argue Klaus Hasselmann was one of the uh, <clears throat> progenitors of this kind of work. Uh, Klaus was in the news recently. He was awarded one third of the share of the 2021 Nobel Physics Prize for um, <clears throat> developing methods for identifying specific signals, fingerprints that both natural phenomena and human activities imprint in the climate. <clears throat> What was his key insight? Well, back in the 1970s, people who were interested in trying to identify human effects on climate were gen generally looking at individual grid points, individual locations um, <clears throat> on the Earth's surface in model simulations. And they were trying to understand when we increase CO2 or introduce some other perturbation how large is the change in say surface temperature at that grid point relative to natural climate variability? And Hasselmann's insight was, it is necessary to look at the entire field. And the key words in this quote from his 1979 paper are that you need to look at signal and noise as multi-dimensional vector quantities rather than at individual grid point statistics. So what does that mean in practice? What you see here are two maps. Um, the top one is the response of the troposphere in 28 different uh, climate models. These are all models that participated in phase five of the couple model intercomparison project uh, to human caused increases in greenhouse gases uh, and particulate pollution. And when you run models with increased um, <clears throat> CO2 uh, and uh, other um, human factors over the satellite era, 79 through to the present, this is the kind of thing you get. You get warming at every location and you get larger warming even above the Earth's surface uh, over the Arctic where we've seen large decreases in the extent uh, and, thick, and thickness of Arctic sea ice and in high latitude snow cover. And you also see even in the troposphere, this um, difference that Kate mentioned between warming over land and warming over ocean. When you run the same uh, roughly three dozen different climate models in so-called control run mode, so with no year to year changes in CO2 or other external factors, you get a very, very different uh, dominant pattern of variability. And this is um, <clears throat> the leading pattern of variability uh, from these 36 different model control runs. And it shows features we know and love as climate scientists, this canonical El Nino-like feature here um, in, in the Pacific. But the kicker is that the patterns are obviously different. And this was Hasselmann's point. He said, if you're looking at individual grid points and you're trying to find a human caused signal over the Arctic, well, uh, the signal is pretty big over here, but the noise is even larger than the signal. And that will make it difficult to identify a human effect on climate. So take a step back and look at the entire pattern that gives you a better chance of discriminating between human and natural effects. 
if you look at the satellite data uh, over the um, last roughly 40 years or so, it's visually obvious, even without any complex um, statistical analysis, that the way the real world lower troposphere temperature has actually changed is far more similar to the human influence fingerprint predicted by the models than to the small scale opposite sign patterns of natural climate variability. And of course, we don't only visually eyeball pattern correspondence. What we do is we rigorously uh, use pattern recognition methods to compare the search for human influence fingerprint with observations. And we also compare that search for human influence fingerprint with patterns of natural climate variability, which is what you see here in orange. This is essentially using all of the world's um, computer models to estimate natural climate variability, to search for the chance uh, similarity between the human influence fingerprint and patterns of natural variability. And you get this kind of distribution here, symmetrical about zero. So by chance, you can have, in this case, 40 year periods where the search for human influence fingerprint that I just showed you is dissimilar or becoming more similar over time uh, to the patterns of natural variability. But the, the satellite data um, show that the kind of pattern correspondence we get between the actual um, <clears throat> tropospheric temperature data and the search for human influence fingerprint is highly unusual. We just can't get this kind of pattern correspondence, uh, which we have here for three different data sets from Alabama, uh, the University of Maryland, and Santa Rosa. We can't get this kind of correspondence by um, any mode of natural climate variability that we, we know. Uh, and in physics, the gold standard is often um, stated to be five sigma result. That was the, uh, the standard for dis discovery, for example, of the Higgs boson. In climate science, we're well beyond five sigma in terms of doing fingerprinting with tropospheric temperature. Um, <clears throat> but of course, we don't only look at, at geographical patterns of climate change, and that moves uh, <clears throat> to Suki Manabe, uh, who was awarded part of the 2021 Nobel Prize for physical modeling of Earth's climate and for better understanding variability and predicting global warming. And one of Suki's key insights that directly touches on fingerprinting was this. In a very famous paper in 1967 with his colleague, Dick Weatherald, using a radiative convective model, so just looking at global mean temperature, but resolving global mean temperature at different layers in the atmosphere, uh, again, from the surface up to about 40 kilometers. Uh, and this, has a, this model has convection in it. Manabe and Weatherald increased CO2 from 150 to 300 to 600 parts per million. And when they did that, they saw the stratosphere cooled and the troposphere warmed. Uh, and this was a true prediction. This is 1967. We didn't have the satellite data to give us information about the vertical structure of atmospheric temperature change. We did have weather balloon data, but it was sparse. And uh, many of the early weather balloons actually burst when they got above 20 to 25 kilometers. So reliable determination of whether the stratosphere was in fact cooling in response to CO2 increases uh, was, was difficult to do. <clears throat> this now um, is a satellite-based estimate of the vertical structure of atmospheric temperature change. It's over the full 42-year um, period of the satellite record from 1979 to 2021. This is from our colleagues uh, at Remote Sensing Systems in Santa Rosa, California. And the key point here is the troposphere has warmed with largest warming in the lower troposphere over the Arctic, where we've seen, like I said, nearly a, 
45 to 50% decrease in Arctic sea ice extent. And the, uh, the atmosphere has cooled in the lower stratosphere. If we went higher up into the mid to upper stratosphere, this cooling actually amplifies. And this pattern of warming low down and cooling up high is fundamentally inconsistent with the sun explains everything fingerprint. Uh, that pattern of coherent warming throughout the full vertical extent of the atmosphere. And it is consistent with the early Manabi and Weatherall 1967 prediction. This is what you get if you increase atmospheric CO2. You more effectively trap heat lower in the atmosphere. Uh, less heat reaches the lower, mid, and higher uh, <clears throat> stratosphere where we see the direct radiative signature of CO2 increase. So I would argue that this kind of information uh, about correspondence between simulated and observed patterns of climate change has been highly influential in that arc of history that I showed you earlier. Now, one um, criticism of the IPCC's finding in 1995, the discernible human influence was you folks are only looking at temperature. And if there is indeed a human caused climate change signal lurking in observations, you should not just see it in temperature, you should see it in atmospheric circulation, in the hydrological cycle, in uh, sea ice and snow extent. And indeed, since 1995, as Kate nicely showed with surface specific humidity, Climate scientists have interrogated many different aspects of um, observed climate change, aspects that are physically related, but are measured uh, independently with a wide range of in instruments on the ground, um, in situ, from space, using satellites, LIDAR, uh, you name it, uh, weather balloons. And the bottom line message from all of this stuff is that human fingerprints aren't just in temperature only, we can see them in many, many different aspects of the climate system. And I'll just highlight here um, from a few papers here, moisture content, global precipitation, um, surface specific humidity, continental river runoff, um, the intensity of precipitation, sea level pressure, um, and some of this work was, was done at, at crew. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Arctic moistening, stratospheric ozone, salinity. Um, it's, it's a very, very long list where pattern-based detection has shown um, clear scientific evidence of human effects on climate. Just finally, um, <clears throat> my scientific career has been a search for human-caused signals in the climate system. And I've been privileged to uh, do this work at CREW and later uh, <clears throat> at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And one of the things I've learned is that in addition to the scientific imperative to improve our understanding of the drivers of climate change, we also need to talk about values and what really matters to us. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm a climber, uh, I'm a mountaineer, I've spent a lot of my life in beautiful, fragile, high alpine environments around the world. These are pictures I've taken <laughs> over one human lifetime as a mountaineer. And I've witnessed profound changes in uh, glaciers in the Himalayas, the Alps. Um, this here is the Juneau ice field uh, in, in Alaska. So in addition to the the science driver to understand how and why our planet is changing, it's also critically important to have discussions on why this matters and on what kind of world we want to leave behind for future generations. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ben, for that elegant summary of an elegant body of work. Um, can we have questions, please? We'll go on online first this time if we have a question. Natasha? Uh, yes, we've got a question from an anonymous attendee um, saying, thanks for the nice informative talks from Ben and previous speakers. Um, 
They have two questions, so I'll ask one first. Um, <laughs> are there any studies showing how human-induced changes are now modifying natural variability? Any comments on developments or expectations? Um, what a great question. And the answer is yes. So one of the things I didn't mention was large initial condition ensembles. These are um, <clears throat> simulations where you take one climate model and you rerun it many, many times from slightly different initial conditions of the atmosphere and or ocean. And this has been done by most of the major modeling groups around the world. <clears throat> so essentially you get different plausible trajectories of observed climate change, say over the uh, 20th and early 21st century. With the same climate model, you can perform what I mentioned earlier, a control run, which gives you the pure internally generated variability in the model. So statistically, what you can do is you can ask whether the pure internally generated variability in the model, say the behavior of El Ninos and La Ninas uh, in terms of amplitude, uh, pattern, and time scale, is equivalent to the between realization variability of the same physical climate model that you infer from the large initial condition ensembles. Uh, and the answer seems to be that for El Nino, uh, the external forcing in the large initial condition ensemble seems to modulate uh, the pattern and uh, possibly the amplitude of El Nino variability. Um, this, this is something that uh, I'm looking at with a colleague of mine, Juliana Palota, uh, in the frequency domain. And we've looked at this in five different large ensembles. And in each one, we find that the, um, <clears throat> the external forcing is modulating that model's um, <clears throat> El Nino variability. So it's, it's a fascinating issue. Um, other people have looked at the influence of volcanoes on, uh, on internal variability. And it's one where these large initial condition ensembles are really very well suited to address the question of whether forcing is modulating variability. Question within the room. Uh, we'll uh, we'll move on. The, there are more questions on online, Ben, um, but we'll we'll move on at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Trevor. And uh, finally, the, there was another question for uh, Ben. Um, you summarized a list of factors that contributed to scientific progress on climate fingerprints. What are the key questions or priorities to address now, especially with policy making in mind? Uh, what are the major bottlenecks? And how do you think further significant progress may be achieved over the next five years? Mm -hmm. I think the, the bottlenecks are the policymakers, quite frankly, <clears throat> not the science. Um, <clears throat> as that arc of understanding showed um, over the last 30 plus years, scientists have learned a tremendous amount about the uh, drivers of climate change, both natural and human. They've done and continue to do um, <clears throat> important work in terms of quantification, the disentangling of human and natural influences and using the kind of machine learning uh, techniques that Cassia described in her presentation and applying them to <clears throat> separating human and natural effects on climate. I would argue that the main barriers to scientific um, <clears throat> progress uh, <clears throat> are barriers to implementation of solutions uh, and um, we're, we're not really in a situation where they're, they're, they're fundamental <clears throat> unknowns um, 
the planet is going to warm and it's going to continue to warm significantly if we continue to emit greenhouse gases. And to me, mitigating uh, <clears throat> human caused emissions is the biggest single problem we all face um, now. Thank you, Ben. Well, if, if there are no more urgent questions, um, I think it's time to firstly congratulate the seminar organizers from the Climatic Research Unit for putting together such a coherent program, observations and the way in which those observations might be used uh, with an adequate opportunity to highlight the importance of um, Crew's contribution over the last 50 years. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I'd also like to thank our four excellent uh, presenters. Phil, here in the room, uh, Kate, and Ben, and Cassia online. Um, all excellent presentations um, with wonderful slides. Um, I'd like to thank you on behalf of, of the whole audience.